Suppose there's a new and promising treatment for a type of cancer. It has shown potential in early clinical trials, and now comes, finally, the big study to compare its effectiveness against an existing treatment. As the primary outcome, the researchers want to know if, and to what extent, the new treatment can increase patients' survival. But how would you design a study like that? It might seem fairly straightforward. Just randomly assign patients a type of treatment and record the time of death. So what's the catch? Well, what if some patients are still alive at the end of the study? Should you wait for everyone to pass away? Keep your study running for what might be years or even decades? That would be inefficient, costly, impractical, and by the time any such study would finish, there would undoubtedly already be better treatments available. So, instead, our study runs for a predefined fixed time, and we can observe patients passing away only within this window. But if our study ends, and some patients are still alive, how can we estimate, let alone compare, survival? This is at the core of what survival analysis is about. Patients surviving beyond the duration of the study are said to be censored. Their time of death could be next week, next month, one year, or many years ahead. We simply don't know. But we do know they survive for at least as long as we have observed them. We know their death is somewhere to the right of this circle. So we call these observations right censored. In addition, patients may drop out of the study for reasons unrelated to their survival. Think stress, traveling time, hours of missed work, relocation, or family matters. This isn't hypothetical, nor uncommon, and a quick search will show you this can happen in over 30% of included patients in clinical trials. These patients are then also right-censored, because we know they survived at least up until the point they dropped out. It is important to keep these observations in the data, as they do provide information about the survival. For example, if I ask what the probability of survival was here, you can't just say 2 out of 3, as the censored observations were clearly still alive at this point. But it's harder over here, because patient 3 may or may not have also died at this point. So how do we compute survival? This is a survival curve, better known as the Kaplan-Meier curve. It shows time on the x-axis and the probability of survival on the y-axis. At the beginning, survival is 100%. After 250 days, the probability of survival is estimated to have dropped to around 60%. And after 500 days, the probability of survival is only 29%. Note how survival doesn't go all the way down to zero. That is because at the end, there were still some censored observations in this dataset. Taking right censored observations into account is surprisingly simple. Going from left to right, the curve you're looking at is estimated as follows. Start at a probability of survival of 100%. At the first day on which at least one patient passed away, divide the number of surviving patients by the number of patients at risk. To be at risk, you need to be alive and observed. If any patients have been censored in the meantime, they are no longer at risk because we can't observe them. On this day, one patient passed away, all were still at risk, so that gives us this fraction of surviving patients. We multiply this fraction by the previous probability of survival, and this gives us then the new probability of survival. At the next time of at least one recorded death, again divide the number of surviving patients by the number of patients still at risk. On day 11, three patients passed away, one patient already passed away before, so 227 were at risk. Multiplying this fraction by the previous probability of survival, we obtain our new probability of survival. New time points, new number of surviving and at risk, new fraction, new probability of survival. The only thing that changes with censored observation is the number at risk. This procedure can be summarized in the following formula, called the Kaplan-Meier estimator. For the probability of survival at a given time, we take all time points with events until that time and multiply their fractions of surviving patients. If you have an estimator, we have uncertainty. And so it is also possible, and very useful, to compute a standard error for this estimator. I won't show that here, 
but what I will show you is what you can do with this standard error. Add a nice 95% confidence interval everywhere around the Kaplan-Meier curve. Now we can make interesting statements, like the probability of survival at a given time point is estimated to be within this and that. You can also have multiple Kaplan-Meier curves, like the ones shown here, which separately show the estimated survival of men and women. This opens the door for hypothesis testing of different groups, like the example given all the way at the beginning, where we were interested whether one treatment yields better survival than another. This is typically computed through a log rank test, which compares the observed and expected number of events at every time point for both groups and checks if they differ significantly. In this example, you can clearly see that women have a higher survival than men, as is often the case, and according to the log rank test, this difference is significant. Working with survival data is not all that complicated. All you need is an estimator that accounts for censoring and understanding the additional assumption of proportional hazards. Much of what you can do with ordinary linear regression can be done in survival analysis using the Cox proportional hazards model. Since this video is only meant as an introduction to the subject, I will not go into detail on the Cox pH model here. Instead, I want to share with you a few more important phenomena that arise in survival analysis and how to recognize them. Previously, I used this figure to explain the idea of right censoring, where we know that the event of interest happens sometime after the last recorded time, but we don't know when. Though slightly less common, it is also possible for observations to be left censored. This means that we know the event happened before some recorded time, but we don't know exactly how long ago. This is easier to understand if we change the event of interest to, say, an infection. For example, a patient might start displaying symptoms, and we can test for infection and conclude that the patient is indeed infected, but what we just recorded is not the time of infection, but the time of testing positive. In reality, the patient may have been infected for any number of days already possibly even before the start of the study. In some studies, observations have neither a known starting time nor end. For example, because we know infection occurred during a holiday, but we couldn't test until afterwards. In this case, we only know that it must have occurred within some interval, and this type of observation is therefore called interval censored. Lastly, there is the more tricky phenomenon of truncation where observations are only included in the data at all if they occur within a certain time. For example, imagine again a study on cancer treatment. Some clinical trials allow delayed entry, where additional patients can be included in the study at a later time point. For example, because they were diagnosed with cancer after the start of the study. This has the obvious advantage of growing your sample size, but it comes with a difficult type of bias. Namely, in order to be included in the study, you need to survive long enough to be diagnosed with cancer. Any hypothetical patients that died before entry are left truncated. Right truncation occurs, for example, with historical data of death, where surely you'll agree with me that in order to be part of this data set, you need to have died first. This is an important phenomenon to realize if you plan on using historical data of deaths that is recent enough for part of the population of interest to still be alive. The most common of all these phenomena are right censoring and left truncation. Note that neither censoring nor truncation are the same as missing data. In the case of censoring, we have some lower or upper bound for the value it should have been. In the case of truncation, it isn't possible to have truncated observations in the dataset at all. This is completely different from missing data, where we do have observations in the dataset, but we don't know the value of one of the variables of that observation. One final important phenomenon in survival analysis is that of a competing event. If a cancer patient passes away from a traffic incident, you don't record that as a cancer-related death. In this case, one event prevents the other from happening, and hence the name competing events, or competing risks. You can interpret this as a right-censored observation, in that they were going to die from cancer at some point, but you just don't know when, but it is not quite the same phenomenon. 
because we actually have a sharply defined time of event. It just happens to be a different event. There's a separate class of models that can deal with competing risks called multi-state models. In summary, survival analysis owes its name to the idea of studying time until death. But more generally, you can use it to study any kind of time until event data, which makes it one of the staple methods of statistical analysis. In survival analysis, phenomena like censoring and truncation occur. Censored data can be accounted for using the Kaplan-Meier estimator, which gives rise to the archetypal survival curve you may have seen before in literature. These are constructed by taking into account the number of events that occur at a given time and the number at risk at that time. Kaplan-Meier survival curves can be compared with a log rank test, and a more general model for regression analysis with time until event data is the Cox proportional hazards model. You may unknowingly have already encountered censored data before. The time until birds lay eggs is left censored if you find the eggs already there in the morning. The intensity of GFP fluorescence is right censored if it exceeds the detection limit. And so is the number of bacteria on an agar plate if there are too many to count. And the time you got infected with the coronavirus is probably interval censored because it happened sometime after exposure and somewhere before you tested positive. There are many well-developed packages for survival analysis in R, and especially for the common case of right censoring, it really isn't all that hard to work with, as you can see from the example I use in this video. I recommend having a look at some of the vignettes of the package survival if this topic interests you. Thank you for watching.